Let's see if you can relate to this story. You browse online through your favorite 3D portfolio art websites. After seeing some amazing 3D models by some talented artists, you feel a powerful sense of inspiration. If they can make these awesome detailed 3D models, so can you. You got this. Today's the day you create that next level 3D model. You snag some references and you open up your favorite 3D modeling application. Look at that complex model. It's apologies for suckers, man. I could do this all day. After hours of pushing and pulling verts, you look at your model and instead of seeing mainly these, You see mainly D's. Let's turn on the wireframe, see how this is looking. Ugh. Doesn't look that great. Your model is not off to a great start, but you have one last hope. Entering subdivision mode. But I'm sure if I select it and go into sub D mode, it'll smooth out fine. Okay, maybe you don't got this. You eventually realize that creating that detailed 3D model will require proper topology and learning it might be a little harder than you initially thought. So why is this so hard to learn? And is there any way to fast track learning this mystical skill set? If this sounds anything like you, you came to the right video. This is your host, JL Musi. And today we're going to be taking a deep dive at 3D modeling topology and some great actionable steps that you could implement today to start creating better 3D models with awesome topology. Before we deep dive into the video, make sure to snag your copy of the hard surface modeling cheat sheets. This is a free resource that I created to help kickstart your 3D modeling and you could download that resource using the link right here. The truth of the matter is that many beginner 3D artists struggle with topology. I know this frustration firsthand because when I first started out, I struggled dearly. You were able to see some of my first attempts at 3D modeling before I actually really mastered the craft of proper topology. You see, I came from a traditional art background. I first learned drawing, and each discipline that I learned later on felt like I was actually building off my drawing skills. So for example, I moved from drawing to painting. Painting felt like an extension or a layering effect of knowing how to draw properly. Uh, even things like graphic design felt like they actually benefited from me learning how to draw. So when it came to learning 3D modeling, I thought I'd be able to apply those artistic skill sets into a very technical skill set, which is 3D modeling, which is heavy reliant on proper topology. And this is where I got stumped because this was a very technical skill set that I had to develop. And it really didn't have much to do with all the traditional art background that I learned early on in my career. And I think this is the reason that most 3D artists starting out struggle with topology is that they do come from a artistic background and learning proper topology is a technical skill set that you have to master. And making that pivot from being very artistic to very technical minded can be very, very challenging. Adding to this is the fact that 3D modeling is usually one of the first disciplines that beginner 3D artists actually learn. You're not only learning topology in its entirety when you first start 3D modeling, but you're actually learning the world of 3D on its own. Before we move to the how, let's look at the why. Why is learning 3D modeling topology very important if you wanna become a professional 3D modeler? The very first reason is that proper topology makes you a lot more employable. This is not uncommon to look at job postings, especially for 3D modelers, and they require you to have a solid understanding of creating proper topology. The second reason is having a model with proper topology will allow you to have a optimized mesh. What does this mean? If you've ever worked with CAD data 
or maybe data that's coming from ZBrush and then exported into Blender or Maya, you know that this uh, mesh is usually very, very dense. It's not optimized. That topology, that edge flow is not really where it should be. It's just a very dense mesh or a mush of clay. A mesh that doesn't have proper topology a lot of times can be hard to create certain modeling operations. And a lot of the modeling tools in most 3D packages do prefer a clean, quieted mesh, which relies on clean topology. Another reason to have great topology is that it makes UVing a lot quicker. If you've ever tried to UV a mesh that's too dense or it's very sloppy in the layout of its topology, selecting those edges or those edge loops that you essentially want to add cut lines to can make your life very, very difficult. If you're new around here, I create tutorials that are aimed to simplify the process of learning how to create beautiful 3D art. If you're enjoying the video so far, make sure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to let me know that you're interested in me creating more content like this. What is topology? A 3D mesh is composed of three main components, vertices, edges, and faces. Each single vert is connected by an edge. The way that these edges flow through your mesh is what's known as topology, or it's also known as edge flow. And essentially it's the way that these edges support the details throughout your mesh. Depending on the arrangement of verts and edges on that polygonal face, you're gonna have different type of polygons. A polygon with four verts is known as a quad. This is pretty much the holy grail of topology and what many 3D artists consider very clean modeling. Moving on, we'll have a polygon with three verts and three edges, and essentially this is known what to try. Depending on your ultimate rendering application, so if this is gonna be rendered real time, tries are not an issue. But most of the time, 3D artists will model in quads and then convert that asset into tries at the time of export. Now let's take a look at the villains of the faces within the world of topology. The first one is poles. This is essentially a junction of a vert that contains more than four edges. So anything more than four, five, six, seven, eight is considered to be a pole. Depending on where you place this can be more problematic or less problematic. Poles typically on flat areas are not an issue, even in sub D models. However, on curved surfaces, you really have to be careful of poles as they could often lead to undesirable results. N-gons. N-gons are usually faces that contain more than four verts. So anything that has five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten is a N-gon. And again, this can also cause issues on curved surfaces. And a lot of times it's in your best interest to subdivide those N-gons and create quads for the best result when it comes to topology. Topology tip number five is localized density. This is where you essentially route more topology to areas of detail. And these are the areas that usually need that extra topology to properly support those details. While you don't route all that extra topology to simpler areas that would eventually just bog down your poly count and not really help describe your shape. I primarily achieve this via two methods. One is with topology patterns, and the second is by separating my parts. Let's look at topology patterns first. And the first topology pattern that I wanna go ahead and break down is the reroute pattern. I'm gonna demonstrate these two patterns on a simple plane, that way they're very easy to see. And then we'll go ahead and jump through some of my different models that I created over the years and see how they're actually applied. And what the reroute pattern does is pretty much exactly how it sounds like. It basically reroutes your topology. Uh, in this case, if I take my multi-cut tool here, and I'm gonna go ahead and control middle mouse click, 
it's going to go ahead and add a edge loop right here in the middle. I don't want to route this all the way through, right? And this is the first step in localizing your topology is figuring out the areas of detail that you basically want to encompass and then leave the simpler areas or simpler parts of your model that don't need that detail basically without that flow of edges going into it. So what I'm going to do is first basically decide where I want to cut off that loop. And I'm going to take these uh, three uh, edges here, control delete. Now this is going to be deleted. Now what we could do from this point is actually start routing this the way that we want. And if we wanted to route this this way is basically just come from the different uh, direction here. I'm going to do control middle mouse click. Then I'm going to connect this with the multi cut tool. Uh, extra tip there is that anytime that you go from a five sided to a try, you're going to go ahead and get pretty much all quads. Uh, one functionality of the uh, multi cut tool is that if you do control shift, you're going to be able to snap to basically uh, 45 degree increments, which is kind of nice. So I'm going to hit enter and that's pretty much the pattern there. Another cool thing that I can do is if I want to push this on a 45 degree angle to be very, very precise, uh, this would be kind of a guessing game. I can hit D on my keyboard, hold down control, and then basically orient my pivot to that edge. So now if I go back to the move tool and just slide that out, you see that this is giving me a really precise uh, corner here. And we can push it here if we want like this. And if we wanted to be super, super precise, we could actually uh, take this whole edge here, bring up my move tool. Since I am edited the pivot, what I can do is hit D and uh, that's gonna enter me into edit pivot mode. Anywhere outside of that pivot, you can quickly reset this. I can hold down V, snap that to this vert, and now I can scale this flat. And I could actually do the same here as well. So I can scoop up this and it's already oriented uh, to this vert and I can square this out as well. That was a very small change. So if I jack this up, so it's a little bit more visible and I go back and reselect those edges, you see the effect there a little bit better. So that is essentially um, the first instance of the reroute pattern. So now you have a clean loop and if you wanted to create a panel line, you would just essentially bevel this and then now you could select this and extrude it. You see now that that topology is essentially turning that corner. Uh, another a very clear example of this is uh, when you actually start creating radials. So this is a prime example of a reroute as well. Um, what we're gonna do is just essentially reset this pivot again. I'm gonna hold down shift. So anytime that you hold down shift in Maya with combination of any transform, uh, you could actually uh, extrude as well. So you're extruding the topology and scaling, which is essentially what an extrude is doing. But this way you can just hold down shift with the scale tool and you'll be able to basically uh, extrude that topology in. You see that this is properly routed and I can hold on shift, right click, and we can do a circularized components. A lot of times if, if you have these radial insets, it, it's nice to do that initial extrusion. That way uh, you essentially end up with this uh, five star pattern because essentially anytime that you do a reroute pattern, it is gonna consist of a five star, see? So you have the five star here, and all that means is you have essentially five edges here. And really that edge that's breaking up that uh, perfect um, quad there, right? That's the change in direction. So you see it here, and we can verify this if we add an edge loop, you see how it's breaking that way. And same way here, right? So this edge here is rerouting your topology over and preventing it from going straight, right? So if we were to go here, it's going straight. And just because of this five star, it's pulling it off to the side. Let's go ahead and look at some practical examples of the rewrap pattern. This is a character that I modeled named the mechanic. This is actually using another artist concept. And I'll go ahead and link his art station down there. Some examples of the rewrap pattern are very evident here. So you see that I basically rerouted this to provide essentially more topology to this corner while not throwing um, all those edge loops here uh, towards the rest of the body. And if I actually go in here and just isolate the body, you see that this is done quite a bit here to define parts of the anatomy of this character. 
So here I started hitting at the uh, abdomen area by using a reroute pattern. They're very evident here too, uh, isolating all these muscle groups. So you'll see here that it's uh, basically forming out the triceps, the lats, the traps, the shoulders. So I use these reroute patterns quite a bit. And you'll also see these patterns quite a bit in the mouth to create that radial topology that is very, very important for deformations. And here's the reroute pattern used in hard surface elements. So you see that I usually use it, like I showed you earlier, to contain a lot of radial shapes. On the outskirts of those radial shapes, you'll usually see that reroute pattern pretty much containing all those radial details and not spreading them throughout the mesh. And here's another example of a more complex shape where you see, again, routing all those radial patterns and containing them using those uh, five star points or those reroute patterns. The second pattern that I wanna show off is the diamond pattern. This pattern usually has a separate purpose than the reroute. Usually the reroute is to change the direction. The diamond pattern is more specifically used when I want to solely reduce density from one area going into the other. Let's just say that we had uh, edge flow going this way that we wanted to basically mitigate only to one section. What I'm gonna do is take my multi-cut tool here, drop an edge loop here, and an edge loop here. So let's just say that this area of our model is an area that we needed more density. And this area here had less details, and we didn't want all this topology flowing through. So this is where the diamond pattern would actually come into place. Grab both of these ranges here. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this topology. And now what I could essentially do is with the multi-cut tool, basically connect both of these. So now we essentially have this triangle here, which is not quadded. So we can select that edge that's right in the middle, control delete. And by default, when you do this, especially working on a plane, it actually looks like a try. But if we do a small offset here, now it looks like a diamond, hence this is the name. Again, we're gonna go back to the mechanic and I actually use this diamond pattern in a slightly higher position than the hand. So here, um, I actually wanted uh, some of this topology flowing, but you see that right here, I have this diamond pattern. So I didn't really wanna route all that topology here throughout the forearm, flowing into the rest of the upper arm. So I essentially use that same exact pattern to cut off some of that topology and prevent it from moving upwards on the model. Again here, I use a diamond pattern on the lower back uh, usually around the hip area, especially where characters deform, uh, you tend to have a need for more topology, but I didn't want to route all that um, extra topology towards this area here. Thus, uh, I use another diamond pattern here. Moving on to the second leg of creating localized density is creating your model in separate parts. This is something that has to be used in a case-by-case -case scenario. Not all models are beneficial to break up. However, separating your model in the right stage of your workflow into separate parts could definitely allow for some areas to be denser and not essentially passing down that density to other parts that don't really need that amount of detail or edge flow. So this model is a Volkswagen Beetle and there's a very distinct part that is a perfect example of this localized topology by creating separate parts. So I'm gonna to go towards the back of this very iconic vehicle here, and we'll see that uh, this area here has these grates that are very, very dense. We really wouldn't wanna pass down all this density over to the uh, back here, this trunk of the vehicle. So essentially what we could do is separate this, and this is exactly what I did. So just by having these two meshes separated, we no longer have the need to pass uh, all this topology uh, down. And you see if I take off wireframe uh, on shaded still, actually um, looks pretty good. We really don't have much noticeable pinching here uh, just because everything's relatively clean. One very important tip about breaking up your model into separate pieces is do this at the very end of the modeling stage or towards the end of the modeling stage. If you jump the gun, start doing this too early, what tends to happen 
is that your verts actually don't line up. So if we take a closer look here, even though these are separate parts, you see that these edges here match up exactly. If you separate this a little bit too early, what tends to happen through the natural process of just moving verts around is that these can start to shift a little bit. And even with a little shift, those panel lines, especially around the uh, curved parts of the model, are not gonna be as precise and pristine. So leave this towards the end of the modeling phase. If not, you might cause yourself some headaches with parts, especially with panel lines, not lining up. And you see by this trunk being separate, it does lend itself well if these parts need to be animated in the future. Topology tip number four is to capitalize on symmetry. This essentially means that you're gonna exploit symmetry every chance you get to do the least amount of unique modeling and this will lead to dramatically more even topology throughout your model. And this obviously applies more towards hard surface models. However, there are some case scenarios where this can be used within organic models as well. Before we begin diving deeper into each subset of symmetry, I wanna go ahead and take a look at this example of this crankset. If you're a beginner 3D modeler, this type of asset might be a little bit intimidating, but if we actually look and break this down into the different types of symmetry, you see that this asset looks a lot more manageable and you could really see the power of these four subsets of symmetry that I'm about to cover as you really only have to focus your attention into modeling very small parts of a overall larger complex model. Let's take a look at standard symmetry. This is symmetry down one axis. This is what most beginners think about when they think about symmetry, where basically you're taking a model, you work on half of it, maybe on the X, maybe on the Z, or maybe on the Y, and they go ahead and duplicate that over. And that is all fine and dandy, but there are different levels to this where you could really maximize your symmetry. The next subset of this is radial symmetry, and I've done entire videos dedicated to this, so I will go ahead and link them in the description down below. The overall gist of this is when you look at a object that has radial symmetry, something that has radial details spread out in a cylindrical fashion, what a lot of times you can do is think about the symmetry planes of that object. In this example here, I'm going through the process of setting up radial symmetry for a five spoke rim. A lot of hard surface objects can be broken down into symmetrical planes, even if it is a radial object. And for this example, I have five planes of symmetry since it's a five spoked rim. So really what you could think about this is a slice of a pizza. In this case, it would be a pizza with five slices. And we actually only have to model half of that fifth. By modeling half of that fifth for this particular example, we're able to focus our attention entirely on a small part of the model, and then using the power of a radial symmetry setup, we can go ahead and spread all that even topology updated in real time and see the finalized result. And in that video, I break down the math, exactly what you need to do to be able to do this with any other symmetrical object that has symmetry because once you know the math you could just adjust the numbers and derive at your proper settings to create this setup for any radial object the next subset of this is the order of symmetry this brake lever is another model that i created for my maya hard surface modeling course and again i really thought about the order of symmetry there were parts that were perfectly symmetrical like the actual brake lever part and there were parts that had split symmetry, meaning some parts were symmetrical and some parts were asymmetrical. And what I essentially ended up doing is the parts that were asymmetrical, I would actually detach them and then create the symmetry and retach them towards the end of the modeling workflow to really just capitalize on that symmetry. The last subset of symmetry that I wanna cover is creating repeatable patterns. And this is a little bit different than just straight up symmetry as it's not technically mirrored, but it still revolves around the same principle 
of just duplicating that geometry and using it as effectively as possible. In this YouTube tutorial that I'll go ahead and link down below, you'll see me going through the process of creating any repeatable pattern. And by mainly using very basic modeling tools like Symmetry and the Duplicate Special, you'll be able to create very clean geometry patterns and only have to focus your attempts at clean topology on very small parts. And you're essentially letting the 3D modeling package do the rest of the work. Topology tip number three is what I call booleans and clean. Booleans throughout 3D modeling history have gotten somewhat of a bad rap. I think the reason for this is because a lot of beginner 3D modelers overuse them without really having a good sense of overall topology and more importantly, a good sense of how to get a clean result. On a basic level, what booleans allow you to do is take very basic shapes and use addition, subtraction, or union methods to create more complex shapes. Now, what I wanna show you here is a video that I did on my YouTube channel. I actually use it to create a more complex pipe. In this video, you can clearly see that I do a little bit of pre-planning and make sure that everything lines up properly before I actually do the booleans operation. That should be a main takeaway of this tip is that you definitely want to do a little bit of pre-planning before each piece is actually booling together. So while these pieces are separated, you want to go ahead and pre-plan at any edge loop, any supporting edges, and make sure that both surfaces, once they're combined, will actually leave you with the minimal amount of cleanup possible. I go through the whole process in detail in the video, so I strongly recommend if you wanna follow up on this, check that out. Here's a more advanced example of this, and this is again using that BMX bike. You see this under seat support here is a very complex shape. I would have had a hard time basically starting out with part of the shape and then extruding and trying to modify that. So what I essentially did is model the underside first and then I created each support separately. I did quite a bit of pre-planning and then I joined this together. Once these pieces were joined, because I did all that pre-planning, I was able to quickly go through and merge all these shapes together. And you see that this actually has two different types of shape. One is a curved shape, and then one is very hard surface or very rectangular shapes. By taking these simpler shapes, doing a little bit of pre-planning, combining them, and then cleaning them up, I was able to get a very complex shape with very clean topology that started from a booleans and clean approach. Topology tip number two is what I call destroy and rebuild. Throughout the process of creating hard surface modeling shapes, especially ones with curved surfaces. You go through and you start adding more and more topology, you start adding holding edges, and sometimes when we exit wireframe mode, apply something with a little bit more specularity, and this is something that I strongly recommend when you're modeling in whatever package it is, don't go with the default Lambert or whatever that version of the Lambert is in your package. Give your object something that has a little bit more reflectiveness to it. This will expose any imperfections in your mesh that otherwise might go unnoticed. And with this shiny material, especially on a curved surface, if you started adding too many points and not really controlled where those points, those vertices were, then you might end up with a very lumpy surface. At this point, most beginner 3D modelers, me included back in the days, uh, I used to go ahead and just keep on pushing, keep finagling that mesh. Hours would go by and I'd just keep adding more topology and that mesh or that curved surface would still be lumpy. And this is where destroy and rebuild comes in. In the video, which I have linked down below, a student actually sent me a very lumpy hard surface model with a curved surface. And I actually use this very technique to clean this up rather quickly. What the process entails is mainly two steps. One is actually to remove all the bevels or holding edges first. And then you go through and you pick out the main edges that are describing your shape. And you basically select every other edge 
or every two edges and skip one depending on how dense your mesh is and you actually delete them. Once you have deleted this, you can go back, really perfect that form and then introduce very minimal topology to actually leave that curved surface relatively clean. And the last but most important topology tip that I wanna give you is learn how to UV and texture. And at this point, you might be like, hold up. I thought this was a 3D modeling slash topology video. Well, if you're disappointed, I can go ahead and let you know that I have a 100% money back guarantee on this YouTube tutorial. But all jokes aside, there is a close relationship between 3D modeling, UVing, and texturing. And all these three different disciplines actually tie in together to produce a finalized rendered model. And I'm happy to announce that this summer, I'll be releasing an extensive training that's gonna cover all three of these disciplines. And I'll have a lot more details on that coming soon. So let me go ahead and give you a scenario and maybe you can go ahead and relate, but this is what exactly happened to me. Uh, after a lot of trials and tribulations, I eventually got good at topology and 3D modeling as a whole. So what happened is I fell into a 3D modeling comfort zone. I could essentially model every detail on a asset and that led me to actually avoid learning UVs and texturing. And this was not a healthy relationship that I had with 3D modeling because just like you wouldn't go ahead and 3D model the pores on a character, sometimes it's not beneficial to model every little bit detail on a hard surface asset. And this is where a package like Substance Painter comes in where you can use height and normal information to quickly apply these texture details that actually look like you modeled them in and give you a lot more flexibility. If you look at the video here that I have a link down below, this is a Substance Painter tutorial where I go through the whole process of learning Substance Painter. Throughout that tutorial, I show you how to apply height information on that model that mimics 3D modeled detail on the textures. Here's a more complex example of these bike pedals where I actually use height information within Substance Painter to apply this grid pattern in a procedural manner. And I had so much control over this height information and doing it with Substance Painter in its very flexible layer stack versus had I just modeled this tertiary detail into the mesh within Maya. And anytime that you model details into your mesh, that is a big level of commitment. And all that topology there is not easily modified or removed. You really don't have that same flexibility that you do with a texturing workflow like within Substance Painter. And not only with this grid pattern, but throughout this whole model, you'll actually see that I was able to stamp in a lot of this fine tertiary detail in the form of these text stamping that actually looks like the mesh is pushed in and that this was actually 3D modeled, but this was created with proper UVs and proper texture. Thank you so much for tuning in to this video dedicated on improving your 3D modeling topology. I really wanna hear in the comments down below, which is the one thing that really helped you create better topology on your 3D models. Until we meet again, folks, I will catch you next time.